3.3, this is where we try to measure the position of your data. So if you remember, 3.2 is where we want to, or we measure the spread out of your data. 3.1 is measure the center of your data. So once we know the spread out, how spread out your data, which is the empirical rule, the Shuffle Chef, we did yes, um, yesterday or last time. Now we want to know if we have a particular data, what position is that data compared to every other data? So the easiest thing, like I mentioned on the end of, of, of the Sheffield Chef versus the empirical rule, I mentioned about this Z score. And the Z score is basically tell you this, is basically tell you take the data minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Whatever your data is, minus the mu, which is the mean, divided by the sigma, which is the standard deviation. And if you find a z-score, the z-score just tell you how far apart are you uh, from the mean, right? Meaning if we have a bell-shaped curve and the bell-shaped curve is the same for every single data or for any normal distributed data. And if you if we refer back to the empirical rule, um, when we say within one standard deviation, meaning it's corresponding to a negative one at the z-score and a positive one at the z-score. And if within one, meaning again, between negative one and positive one, it includes 68% of your data. And vice versa between two, which is negative two and positive two, that will consider 95% of your data. And negative three and positive three, that will consider almost all of your data, okay? And if you have a positive z-score, it just tell you that you are above the mean. And you are how many ever step above the mean. For instance, if you have a positive 1.5 z-score, meaning you above the mean 1.5 of the steps, okay? It's not the unit because the unit is the actual data itself, right? But the z-score basically tell how far are you from the mean. And if you have a negative z-score, just tell you that you are below the mean, that how many spaces below the mean. And later on, when we get to chapter six, the z-score is, we call that a standard normal. Standard normal, which is basically tell you that if we have a bell-shaped curve and we, the z-score will be the same for every bell-shaped curve that we have, or a normal distribution curve, okay? So let's take a look at this formula in action or how does, how do we use this formula to answer the question that we needed. And the unique thing about the z-score, ladies and gentlemen, is we can compare the data to a different type of data, right? We can compare my ACT score to my SAT score, or I can compare the weight to the height of the person. Right, so looking at this here, they tell you that the mean score of the ACT is 21.4 with the standard deviation of 5.1. And the mean score of the SAT is 1350 with the standard deviation of 126. The distribution for both of them are approximately bell-shaped curve or a approximately normal, basically tell you that we can use the empirical rule. And you need that in order for you to find a z-score you need to have a approximately bell shape, okay? And the student, let's say if we have one student score 25 on the ACT and another student score 1470 on the SAT, which score is better? So for instance, let's say if you work at the administrative on the, at the university and two students send in their score, one of them send the ACT and one of them send in the SAT score and now you have to pick between the two and you say, well, how do we know which way is better? Because two of them, ACT and SAT, they have a different grading system, right? And the maximum score on ACT is 36, and the maximum SAT score is, uh, I think it's 1800. Is it a 1600, 1800? I, I forgot. Uh, but again, they have a two different system. How do we know which way is better? And that's where the Z, Z score come in. Right? So basically, this is what we need to do is we need to find a z-score for the ACT and a z-score for SAT. And to find a z-score, we need three, uh, 
we need the data. We need how, what is the score of this data, which is the student score is 25. We need the mean, which is the mean for the ACT is 21.4. And we need the standard deviation, which is the standard deviation is 5.1. And if we have those, all we need to do is plug into this formula. And if you look at this thing here, you can see clearly this student is above the mean. The mean is 21, the student score 25. We know the student is above the mean, but how far above the mean are is this student, which is 0.71, right? 25 minus 21 divided by 5.1. And if you did the math, you have 0.71. Now to compare with the SAT, we have to find the SAT Z score, which is again, the SAT data is 1470. The mu is 1350 and the standard deviation is 126. We plug into our formula, which is 1470 minus 1350 divided by 126. And this is what we have is 0.95. And if we compare the two Z score, we can see that the SAT score, the student with the SAT is better among the SAT student, right? Meaning he score higher uh, on the SAT than the ACT student, which is 0.95 is bigger than 0.71, okay? So we can see in terms of the Z-score that what we do is we want to compare uh, relatively to each of them. And then from the Z-score, because it's all normal, or both of them are normal, we can see that the SAT score is higher or better than the ACT student score, okay? So go back. Uh, let me ask you, is there any question on how to find a z-score? The data minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And, you know, one thing about stat uh, statistics, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one thing about statistics is, is, is easy in the way that we all have formula. Uh, the challenge, as I keep on mentioning to you guys, is how can you took the data and plug into the formula that you need. If you can extract out the data that you need and plug in to the information uh, or, or in the item that you have to answer the question, then you are very good at this class, okay? So let's take a look at this second example and where they script, right? They, they, they switch the script on you guys. Instead of asking you what the Z-score they ask you, well, what if I have a Z-score for this particular student, how do I find his actual ACT score, right? And if you look, the information is the same as before. The information is just the same as the previous problem. And to find this item here, basically we just reverse or we do our algebraic equation and we get to this item here. So to be in short, to find the data, to find the data, all you need to do is take the mean plus the z-score multiplied to the standard deviation. So if you look at this, this formula, if you look at the z formula, all I did was I took the standard deviation, I multiplied to the z-score, and then I add the mu to move to the other side, which is we're using our algebraic, we're using our algebraic item to find this uh, to manipulate our formula. So to find a, this item, we know that the mu is 21.2.4 and the z-score they give us is 0.85. So if I plug into this item, we can see that the student score 25.474. And again, question on, so given this item, the student ACT, which is John ACT score is 25.74. All I did was take the Z, plug into the Z, take the mu, plug into where the mu is at, which is, in this case, they give me the Z score is 0.85, okay? And similarly, if I have this question, Kate SAT score have a Z score of 1.3, so you look at this thing here, Kate's score is, should be better than, than um, the previous student score of six, um, 1470, right? The previous student score uh, is 1470. Um, Kate's score, um, Z score is 1.3. And it, why do I say better? Because if you remember, we calculate this student 
uh, we calculate the student score and last time was just 0 0.9 was just 0 0.95 right 0 0.95 this case z score is 1.3 which is it's better than 0.95 so how much better well to do this thing here we plug into our data formula which is the data is equal to the mu the mean plus the z score times the standard deviation and if you add them up you can see that this data this student score this student score um 15 13.8 okay uh if connect math asks you to hold to a uh to to give them a whole unit then the student score 15 14 okay so given this item here question on how do we find the z score versus how do we find the the data and that is only the the two questions they will ask you is they will ask you to find the z score or find the actual data so you have to uh hopefully i did not confuse any of you guys in terms that again uh, the question is probably stop there for this particular problem uh they won't give you this item here i i think i copy and paste and i forgot to delete that this thing here they probably just give you this here which is the tt mean and the standard deviation the sat mean and standard deviation and the distribution is a bell-shaped curve and they say if john have a z score of this what is his act if kate have a z score of this what is her sat okay and and both of john and kate are they are above the average okay and that's why you add them if the z score is negative you will subtract and that's where it's below the average and if you remember in the empirical rule if you remember in empirical rule the center of the empirical rule was the mean and if on the right we have the mean plus the standard deviation the mean plus two standard deviation and the mean plus three standard deviation is that what we have here which is the the two and the three is the z-score the one the two and the three is the z-score and on the left hand side you have a negative two and negative three which is again the negative is the z-score okay and, and that's what we have in in this problem question with with how to find the z-score or how to find the data if they give you the z-score any question here well if you don't have question with the z-score the next thing we have is quartile so what is a quartile your quartile is just like the word a quarter so basically your data all they do is they split your data whatever your data is they split it into four pieces and if you think about this 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 piece of data whatever your piece of data in order to split into four pieces we need to cut three slices right if you cut three slices, the last one is the last piece right so if we have four pieces we only need to cut into three slices. so to cut into three slides which is the first slide will be 25 percent the second slide is another 25 percent but 25 percent of the second one and the 25 percent of the first one that's why it say 50 percent right the the q2 and the q3 which is another 25 percent so the first three quarter which is 75 percent the leftover will be excuse me the leftover will be 25 percent so just think in terms of, of your, you know, you have a piece of data or a piece of paper and you want four equally pieces. And if you want four equally pieces, you only need to cut three times because the last piece, when you cut half, that's your, your last, you know, you don't have to cut four times because if you cut four times, you will have five different pieces. Okay. So this is just basically tell you that for a quartile, we divide our data in even, even, even each quarter. So Q1 is the first quarter, Q2 is the first two item, which is 25, 25, and so on and so forth, okay? And basically they tell you to divide your data into quarterly. And the second item that I would just mention, and, and we won't do a lot of, of of item because I think on Connect Math they only ask you to explain what is the data is or how does the data fall. Okay, so the percentile 
similar to a quartile, percentile is you have your data and instead of divide into four quarter, each quarter, we divide into 100 different pieces and each piece is 1%. So if we want 100 different pieces, all we need to do is we need to cut 99 times, right? Because the last piece is, is the leftover, which is the actual one piece, right? So that's why they say it's between one to 99%, okay? 99 percentile. So because, it, and, and to distinguish, or not to distinguish, but to, to explain or describe this item is basically if you are at a 90 percentile, if they say that you are at the 90 percentile, meaning you are, you are better than 89 other people. Okay, so for instance, if, if you took the ACT and the, the, the score return and they say you are at the 85 percentile. So if we have 100 people took in the test on that particular day, or we have 100 people took the test, and they say that you are 85 percentile, meaning you are at the 85 position, meaning there are 84 other people or below you, okay? So 84% of the population will be below you if you are at the 85 percentile, okay? So in the sense, whatever the percentile is, whatever your percentile, there is one less percent below you. If you are a 92 percentile, meaning there are 91 percent of the population or percent of the data below you, okay? So in, in the sense, that's what percentile is, is we divide into 100 individual slot, and each slot is 1%, okay? So no matter how much you cut, right? You cut 99 times, and if you are at a 100 percentile, meaning there are 99 other people below, 99% of the population below you, okay? So the percentile is basically tell you the position, the percentage, tell you how much the percent is below you. And again, one minus the P, which is one minus the percentage will be the percent above you, okay? Um, so question with the percentile here, which is, again, the percentile is the position of where your data is. Uh, is basically 1% less than what your position will be, the percent below you, okay? So, any question with quartile or percentile? It's basically tell you that you have some data and you split into different group of data. Any question here? And if you don't have question, the last thing we have, the last thing we have is how can we, if we give you a data, how can you do this back plot? Okay, so the back plot um, for this author, for this book, we will use a modified back plot. Okay, so a, a modified back plot is just a little bit different from the, the uh, traditional back plot is they identify the outlier. They, they want to identify some outlier and we will mention more about the outlier in a bit. But to do this modified back plot, this is the step that you need to do. First, we need to know what is Q1, what is the median, and what is Q3, okay? And to find Q1, median, and Q3, our calculator can help us in that process. And looking at this thing here, once you find Q1, median, and Q3, your median is actually your Q2, okay? Q1, Q2, Q3, but your Q2 is your median. And now to find this outlier or to identify the outlier we need this item here which is we need the iqr the iqr is basically you take your q1 or you take your q3 minus your q1 so your interquartile range how far apart from q1 to q3 your inter inter interquartile range is you take q3 minus q1 so we've used the calculator five q1 median q3 to find iqr we take q3 minus q1 and now we need to know what is my limitation we need to find the lower 
boundary. And to find the lower boundary, we need to take Q1 minus 1.5. The 1.5 here is just a fixed number, ladies and gentlemen, it's just a fixed number. We want to set some range and the 1.5 is the range of the item that they want to use, okay? So all we do is we take the Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQO that we found in step two. And to find the upper limit, we take Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQO that we find in step two. And this is what we have is if your data, if your data is lower, if you have your boundary and your data is lower than the lower boundary, we say that that is an outlier. Or vice versa, if you have a data is bigger than your upper boundary, then we say that is an outlier. It's basically the, 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 the extreme value that will um, influence your data. And if you remember in chapter, in, in 3.1, when, when I say that the median is resistant, and I told you the resistance is basically, we try to find a position and your outlier will not affect the position, okay? And the mean is not resistant because the mean you have to add all your data up and divide it by, divide it by the total number of data. So for instance, if, if you know, student usually they ask, oh, is there a curve? Do you give a curve? Well, in order for me to give a curve, I have to know what is the average of the class. And for instance, if a lot of students have the grade in, in terms of 60 and 70, let's say the majority of students have the grade in 60 and 70, and that's why they want to have a curve, and we have one student make 99 on the test. Well, if you use that 99, you add them all together, you can see that the average will be influenced by the, that 99%, the average is no longer around a 60 and 70 mark because of that 99. So in the way, if we can identify the outlier, we can say, oh, that is the outlier. We throw that away and we're just using the, the group of data that clutter together and that will help us a little bit, okay? So that's why we want to ad identify the outlier. So if we know that there's an outlier, we can disregard that and then we will use whatever we have in, in terms of our data, okay? So once we find the outlier, this item is basically, we need to have a, a lower value and an upper value. To find the lower value and upper value is basically the, the smallest data that is not exceeds the lower boundary and the highest data that is not exceeds the upper boundary. And I will mention that more when we do the item. And lastly, you put an X, you put an X if there's an outlier, you identify the outlier, okay? So step four and step five, you know, it's, it's easy for us when we do the problem rather than speaking of, of the item. So let's say we have this example here. We have this example and this is what they ask you to do is construct a back plot for this data. So what is the data, the history of the data or the, the background story? Uh, this is the number of gram of carbon hydrate in a 12 hour cup uh, expression bread brush at Starbucks, right? So look at this item. How do we find, uh, how do we construct the back plot? And to construct the back plot, the first thing we need is we need to find Q1, Q2, Q3, or Q1 median, Q3. And to find the Q1, Q2, Q3, I mentioned this, which is your calculator can help you with this item here. So if you were to look at this item here, so let me clear this item. So to use your calculator, this is what you guys need to do is you need to hit staff and you need to edit as always. This is what we have. We need to edit. And let me, uh, let me skip this step. Since I have, ah, uh, not mine. I, I delete it. I always say I got the data already. But uh, again, this is what we have is you need to hit stat, go to edit and type your data. We have 22 data. We need to type the 22 data in my L1. And to type my, again, um, 14, 43, 38, 44, 31, 27, 39, 59, 9, 10, 54, 
14, 25, 26, 9, 46, 30, 24, 41, 26, 27, and 14. So if you look at your, no, if you look at your data, you can see that the last data 14 is L1 say 22, meaning that is I have 22 data. So again, one thing like I, I keep on mentioning a lot of the problem for this class is, is calculator driven. Uh, make sure you type in your data, right? Double check your data. Again, my data, I have 14, 27, 26, 41, 24, 30, 46, 9, 26, 25, 14, 54, 10, 59, 59, 39, 27, 31, 44, 38, 43, and 14. So again, you know, take a, 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 a you know, 15 seconds or 30 seconds to double check your work, check, double check your data, right? So once you have your data, you hit stat one more time and you go over to calculate. As you can see, so far we only using one for stat which is one voice that you leave the frequency blank for 83, you just press enter and they calculate this for you. And reminder, this is what we have last time, which is the mean, the average is 29, S, the S is your sample standard deviation and your sigma is your population standard deviation. Those are the things we use on the previous section. The thing we need is if you scroll down, if you press down, if you scroll down, they tell us the n is equal to 22. That's what we have. We have 22 data. They tell us that the minimum data, the smallest data in my data is nine, and the maximum data I have in my data is 59. So they tell me the minimum is nine and the maximum is, is 59. And the other thing that we need, if you look at the item, we need Q1. They tell us the Q1 is 14. We need the median which is 27 and we need the Q3 which is 41. So everybody see that your calculator is your best friend in this class. They calculate this for you. You don't have to do it by hand. You can do it by hand, but your calculator do find L1, uh, Q1, Q2, and Q3. So first of all, question on how to utilize your calculator here. How to find Q1, Q2, and Q3. So if we have, once we have our Q1, our median and Q3, now the second step they tell us that we need to find the Q, uh, IQR, the interquartile range. And to find the IQR is very easy. You take the Q3 minus the Q1. And it's just a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, it's just a coincidence that in our data, your IQR is the same as your median. <clears throat> Again, <clears throat> it's just a coincidence, it's not always the case, okay? It's just a coincidence that I, my IQR is, my, is equal to my median, it's, you know, it's the same number, I should not say equal, it's the same number as my median. Because the median is the data and the IQR is the range, how far apart from your Q1 to your, your Q3. So again, it, it's, it's two different units, okay? This is the amount and this is the range of the item. Okay, so once you find your IQR, now we have to find a boundary. And the boundary for the lower boundary, we need, need to take Q1. <clears throat> Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR, which is 1.5 times 27 to give me uh, 40.5. And I take 14 minus 40.5 to give me a negative 26.5. So that is my lower boundary. So if you remember the data, the calculator tell us that the smallest data I have is nine. So we can see we don't have any outlier. We don't have any number smaller than 26.5, right? If your data, if you have a data, if you have a negative 27, we say that is an outlier because negative 27 is smaller than negative 26.5. Or if you have a negative 50, then we say that that is an outlier. But as you can see, we cannot have a, a negative amount of carbon hydrate in our coffee, right? <clears throat> so the second thing we need to do is once we find a lower limit, we need to find the upper limit, which is the upper boundary. 
And to find the upper boundary is just basically you take the Q3, add it to the 1.5 times the IQR, which is you add to the 40.5. And if you add to that, you have 81.5. And if you remember our data or your calculator tell you that the highest data you have is 59. So if the highest data is 59, we can see that we don't have any number bigger than 81.5. So there is no outlier. Everybody see the, how to identify the outlier. It's basically if you have any particular data that is bigger than this upper boundary or smaller than this lower boundary, then we say that is an outlier. So step one, you know, find the Q1 median and Q3, your calculator can give you that. Step two, we find the IQR, which is interquartile range. You take Q3 minus Q1. And step three, we need to find the boundary, our limitation, right? So once we have that, this is what we need to do is we need to create a bar plot. And to create a bar plot, if you look at this item here, my data is from nine to 59, which is I can start from zero to 60. I don't need any bigger than this item here, okay? And once you have this data, all you need to do is identify your lower data, your minimum data. And in this case, remember your minimum data has to be a data that is bigger than your, your lower limit, right? Your Q and your higher, your maximum data that is smaller than your item, which is everybody see that my nine. My nine is my minimum data, which is the calculator tell me that my minimum data is nine. So nine is here. You know, it's have, it doesn't have to be exact, it's just somewhere there. And my highest data is next to each other, which is my highest data is 59. My 59 is there. So I identify the minimum value and the maximum value. And then I identify my Q1, which is Q1 is 14 somewhere, maybe a little bit more over to the right, but somewhere there, 14, right? And my Q2, which is 27, and my Q3, which is 41. So I identify the five item I need, right? And sometimes if you Google this and, and or you try to find they, they might have, they might say the five, uh, five uh, back plot summary, uh, meaning again, this is the five item that we have. And once you have this five item, the only thing they tell you is put the box, put the box between Q1 and Q3. So this is your box. And then from Q1, you draw a line to your minimum value. And from Q3, we draw a line to your maximum value. So this is all we have to do in terms of the box plot is your box contain your Q1 all the way to Q3. That is your box. And your, uh, your minimum, you draw a line from the Q1 to your minimum and the line from Q3 to your maximum. You know, back then when I took this class, we called this a box and whisker. Uh, and again, box and whisker, which is we have a box here and there are a two whisker from the lower, the Q1 to a lower limit and Q3 to the uh, maximum number. So one thing is don't make, don't get a confusion that this item here, this item is not your lower boundary. This item is not your lower boundary and this item is not your, upper boundary okay my lower boundary is negative 26 my my negative 26 is somewhere over here my upper limit is our upper boundary is 81 81 is somewhere here okay so your maximum and your minimum is basically one number bigger than the lower limit right the the smallest number that is bigger than the lower limit and the smallest num the the next smallest number that is lower than the the upper limit okay so this is how your box plot look like. Your back plot look like this, which is my box and I have my, my hour layer. So look at this thing here. For instance, uh, first of all, question with this item, how, <clears throat> how to come up with this back plot. And I think on connect math, if, if you have not get to this item yet, I think on, on Connect Math, they make it very easy, user-friendly for you. And, and I think they have like a, a multiple part. Uh, I think like part one, they ask you what is Q1, what is the median, what is Q3. And then on, on the second uh, part, they ask you what is IQR, which is basically 
they you know you don't have to remember the five step they basically ask you step one find this step two find this step three find this and then step four you plug it in okay so um they they make it very um user friendly so i want to point out one thing since you guys don't have question so let's say that for instance for instance if my data let's say if my data some my data have this so let's say if, if i have a data let's say one of my data is 110 so if one of my data is 110 let's say that everything stay the same it's not but let's just say that everything stay the same okay one thing is you can see that my my upper boundary is this item so we still using this number i know that the maximum number now is 110 but remember to find this item here we have to use the number that is cannot exceed cannot be bigger than the upper boundary okay so we still using 50 we still using 59 as my 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 uh maximum value i should say maximum value that is not exceeds the upper limit upper boundary so the only thing different with your box plot now is because you have because you have 110 which is 110 is bigger than the upper boundary you need to put an x here to identify that you have an outlier so this x this x that we put this x that we put that we basically identify that my data have an outlier and my outlier is 110 because 110 is outside outside of the ram of this item right my my boundary is from negative 26.5 to 81.5 if anything less than negative 26 or anything bigger than 81.5 we say that is an outlier and to identify an outlier your modified bar plot to identify an outlier we just put an x we just identify the x and in this case everybody see that my outlier is 110 and you know later on you will see that if if you try to test this thing here if you try to test this item and, and whatever test you try to to create this our liar will influence a lot right you have a bunch of data somewhere here and all of a sudden you have one unit here so a lot of times statistics say oh we have an outlier let's throw this away let's throw this data away and if we throw this data away let's just use what we have let's just use the rest and that will give us a better result and, and because the outlier influence your result okay and, and that's why we we try to identify the outlier if there exists any outlier okay um so question on how to identify the outlier and how to if we were to have an outlier how to put an outlier on your back plot modify back plot any question with 